Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. Alarm, alarm. Uh, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray, and James Holland is um, in a canoe somewhere um, <laughs> off, the, off the western Scottish cold. coast. Cold, shivering in his funny little commando cap. So um, we, we've, we've drafted in um, uh, one of our one of our favourite contributors, um, Waitman Wade Bjorn, who um, is in... You in Newcastle? I'm in Newcastle, okay. yes. He's in Newcastle in his office. I'm um, above the wall. I'm north of the wall. <laughs> Isn't it just south of the wall? <laughs> well, you know what I mean. <laughs> I do. I do. Everything exactly. north of, you know, two miles north of London is in the far <laughs> the far north. So that's where it's I am. Far northern the- reaches. And behind you is a map of what you're what you've just been working on, right? Yeah. So that's the Stadtplan von Lemberg, a nineteen forty one wow. German map. Of of Lviv. Yeah. So yeah, just take it. So 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 it's the a key to the city as well as as well as basically what we'd think of as a map, right? Yes. Yeah. And it's it's almost like um, because it was what's interesting about it. Obviously, when I was doing this project, I came up with I had lots and lots of maps of the city from all different times. Yeah. But this is this map is drawn by the Nazis after they've occupied it, so it captures sort of what it's they're not interested like, in. Yeah, what they're interested in, right? And so, and it even has some of the German administrative buildings and, and offices that weren't there when you know before they took over. Um, you right. know, things that you would need to know if you were sort of visiting the city. And where'd you, you, know, where'd you get where'd you get the map? I don't. I mean, it's not I, that's a facsimile, so that's not actually. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, an original. Um, I wouldn't be hanging it on my wall, um, <laughs> but. I don't know. I mean, like, I, I just went on. I mean, they, they're, these maps are out there. Um, there. There's a there's a guy in the Netherlands. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruin his name. It's like Stoin Horison. And he had a massive, interesting map collection of all kinds of maps. And so you can, you know, you look for these things. And there's several. Oh, there's a Polish website that has. It's really interesting. And, and the listeners might think it's interesting, too, because they they all they have a collection of all kinds like thousands of maps at various scales, yeah. Russian British, German, um, but they also have um, on the website basically a map of Europe with a grid system overlaid, and you can literally see what areas of Europe are covered by the maps that they have. Oh, um, oh, that's interesting. So you can kind of click on it and pull up, you know, whatever maps to include down to city level, because some of these yeah. maps are like, you know, Warsaw or whatever, yeah. or, or, you know, Germany as well, because some of the maps are, are British map, British World War II maps of that yeah. they're using to bomb or whatever. So yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. God, how I think maps are. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about maps. Um, so for those who don't know, what you're what you're doing is you're looking at the you're doing a 3D. We've done a 3D recreation, aren't you? Uh, I mean, so that's what we're working book. on. You, so there's your book, which is for next year, right? Uh, so the book is about very very quickly. The the, the book was about um, this concentration camp in Lviv and what is now Ukraine called Yanovska. And I applied for it and was fortunate enough to get um, a grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council to do a 3D visualization reconstruction model of the wow. camp. With the exception of maybe four or five buildings, um, none of the architecture of the camp remains. The, the, yeah. the site of the camp is still a prison uh, used by the Ukrainians, but it, <laughs> but the buildings are not are not extant. Right. So the question was sort of, can we rebuild this in the digital world um, based off of a variety of historical sources? Uh, yeah. There was a camp photographer who was allowed to walk around the camp, take pictures, wow. and then he escaped with the pictures. <laughs> um, and then there was a, ca- a prisoner architect who was designing the buildings or helping design the buildings. He was forced to do yeah. this for yeah. the Nazis. And in his spare time, he would draw really good plans and, and models and, and images of the camp. And then he escaped and took those with him too. So we have those. So it's kind of like I'm working with an architect and right. with a 3D modeler because eventually this is going to go into a platform called Unreal Engine, which yeah. is a gaming engine. It's not right. a game. We're not making a game, but no, no, no. It's, it's, it helps you to do the environmental stuff. And, and, and then there's going to be a, a public facing sort of portal where you can move through the camp and at, at, at different buildings will pull up primary sources right. um, and tell stories of things that are happening or, or, or those kind of things. So wow. anyway, that's what I'm doing. It's really exciting. Um, that's you incredible. Know, it's, 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 it's really interesting just to kind of get, cause you really have to get down into the weeds, you know? Yeah. So like I, I was 
the architect asked me if I knew what the standard size of a German brick was right. in 1941. And I was like, I, I have no idea. But I went down this rabbit hole, and it turns out there's a guy named Neufert who was obviously German, and he came up with a series of standard measurements, many of which we use today. For example, the height from your countertop to your yeah. uh, cupboards. You know, that, that is actually, a lot of these things are actually standardized. Um, right. And in there, he came up with this thing called the optometric brick, which is an eighth of a meter. Um, and, and that's the brick size. And of course, the Nazis love this because yeah. it's, it's a very standardized thing. And so, you yeah. know, again, that's a, that's a brick. Uh, and I, I also went down a rabbit hole of, of light bulbs, um, which yeah. Twitter was amazing for because I didn't know what, because in, in, in Unreal Engine, you can, you can tell it what wattage of light you yeah. want, and then it'll, yeah. it'll do the physics of the yeah. light. And I was like, well, I don't know what, and so I pick, I, I posted a picture of some of the lights on the fence line and you know, there is apparently light bulb Twitter out there and my God, and light bulb Twitter guy was amazing. And, and he was like, yeah, you know, it's probably this kind of bulb, uh, and, based on this, this is how much light and everything cast else. And, and, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it's really interesting. It's an interesting exercise for an historian as well to do this project, because of course, any image, whether it's a map an aerial photograph or whatever yeah. is a, is a, is a snapshot in time. Yeah. Right. It doesn't represent the period 1941 to 1944. No. Um, you know, so there's this interesting challenge of, you know, how do we represent the fact that we don't know a lot about some of these buildings? Um, yeah. you know, we don't want to give the impression when you're looking at this, at this model that it's, it's accurate completely in the sense of like, this is exactly yeah. what it was like. Yeah. Um, and even, you know, just the, I spent a, a day last week trying to find wa uh, watchtowers um, on the aerial photograph and looking for the, the shadows and, yeah. and, and comparing it to the survivor who had drawn a map and put where the watchtower, you know, it's just, you get, it's a way of getting into your sources. I think that we don't always necessarily have the luxury of the time to sort of just really do a deep dive into yeah you know, what was this place like? But then also, what does that tell us about the people that made it? it it's that idea, isn't it, that, that all the assumptions at work tell you about the, the people that do a thing, you know? I mean, when you, when you, when you even, even if you get into the idea of going to a shop and buying a pint of milk, the assumptions that sit on that, we've all agreed on what a pint of milk is. We're all agreed on what milk is. We're all agreed on what money is, how that transaction works, why it costs more in the shop that's closer to me than the one that's for, you know, all the, all those things. If you talk about a building, the assumptions that a building is packed with in itself. I mean, you're, I mean, you're, you could, you could vanish completely in the weeds here, couldn't you, wait a minute? You could, we yeah. Could, we could never see you again. You could, I mean, the, you know, just a, a really interesting examples are, are the buildings that were sort of created, right? Because this area it used to be a neighborhood of small sort of houses for the railway workers that worked at the right. train station across the, across the road. Right. So some of the buildings have been repurposed for, you know, they were stone buildings or whatever. Um, but some of them are purpose built. So like the gate, there's, there's this famous picture of the gate with the commandant on his horse in front, sort of like yeah. the stereotype of the SS. Into the sort of two pillars on the side, they built these standing cells that are like four feet oh. by four feet where they would cram, you know, 10 or 12 people who they had caught, you know, in the ghetto or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and everybody knew essentially that, that you're done for if you go in there. After a certain period of time, they just take them out of the cells and, and shoot them someplace. Yeah. Um, but again, as you say, you know, somebody had to design that, you know, that, that wasn't a building that was existing. Like they created that. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the, so the, the, on the inside, if you're going out of the camp through this gate, um, the doors on these standing cells are just sort of open metal bars. Yeah. So, so you can see, and so the, and, and the prisoners pick up on this and they talk about it because one of the things that's really interesting and I'll shut up about this camp, but what's really interesting is that, you know, we're using also written sources to get geography, right? Yeah. So, and also to give us a sense of what, what the place meant to people there. And there's lots of survivors who say, look, you know, we'd be walking out of the camp, going to work or whatever, and you would see these unfortunate people. And that, that was the intent, right? I mean, the yeah. intent was yeah, 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 th yeah. those doors are designed so that the prisoners are demoralized or reminded of like, don't mess around because this is yeah. what happens to you. Every time they go in and out of the camp, they see these people, you know, and it's just. So awful. in the, so in the, in commissioning the, the architecture someone's got you know, they need to be able to see this we need this is the intent the purpose so there's been there's been a, and there's been a committee meeting surely where someone's going no maybe is that a good idea i don't know i mean even when you say that the guys on horseback 
stereotypical SS? Is he on his horse thinking, oh, I look a bit I look a bit of a cliche, or is he thinking this is the this is the right way to do it? Is the photographer arguing with him? You know what I mean? I mean, would you if you go right into what these people are thinking, what they might be thinking, and how how will obviously we'll never know. On, on some level. I mean, it's fascinating. Anyway, but we're not here to talk about this, are we? <laughs> yeah, we're not. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, I think yeah, I think this is very good. We've, we've rabbit holed um, quite convincingly. Um, I feel like these, these, these podcast episodes, having listened to almost all of them, they, they don't really count unless we don't talk about the topic for the first 10 minutes or so. So, <laughs> so this, this works. <laughs> so what we are going to talk about instead is this extraordinary book that you recommended to me about, it's about 18 months ago or a year ago, maybe called, called The Warriors. By J. Glenn Gray, um, which is um, what's what's really interesting about what, what's fascinating about this is um, a long time ago I was completely obsessed with the. Uh, this is a tangent again. I was completely obsessed with the moon landings, right? And you know Al Bean, who went to Apollo twelve, he he retrained as an artist and he became an impressionist painting. Would paint his experiences of being on the moon and he would grind bits of his badges and costumes into the canvas and all this sort of stuff. And the paintings are amazing. And he always said the reason he'd done that is he said at some point they were going to send a painter to the moon, but there hadn't been time. And at some point they were going to send an artist or a f- poet to the moon, but you know, only 12 guys went, they were, it was going to take them some time to get round to this. So he thought what he had to do is retrain as an artist so that there would be art that represented going to the moon. I was reminded of that because Jay Glenn Gray was a philosopher when he joined the US Army, when he was conscripted. And I think, uh, uh, and the fact is the US Army sent philosophers to war in a way that NASA never got round sending artists to the moon. Just, just you see my point here? And, and that's what's so brilliant about this book, about the Warriors, which is, um, and he's a Hegel guy. He's, the, the, he, you know, he's very much of his time in, in terms of his approach to philosophy from the, from before and after the war. But he's, he sits down and he writes this book in the 60s, doesn't he, when Vietnam's underway, to try and digest his experiences of war and where they might sit philosophically in our view of the world. And it is the most amazing, challenging book. And I, and I read it, like I said, when 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 you first suggested it to me, and I've, and I've gone back to it, obviously, uh, for, for this chat. And it it's a staggering thing. How did you come across it? I was thinking about this when I was, because I, I reread it too, like I... I did a deep dive into reading it again this last week and in yeah. preparation. And uh, so I think I, I was exposed to it during my comprehensive exams for my PhD. Um, and, yeah. and for those who don't really understand it, it's, it's for your comprehensive exams, at least in the U.S. version or at least in the U.S. United, uh, University of North Carolina version, you do three fields which have at least 40, 50 books in each one that you have to read. And one of them is sort of your field, so like modern Germany. Yeah. Um, another one is sort of your geographic area, but a different time period. So mine was early right. modern Germany. Right. But then right. my other one was, a, the other one is sort of one you can choose based on your topic. And since my dissertation was about the German army and the Holocaust, yeah. I did a field in what's called the new military history with a guy named Joseph Gladhar, who's an amazing American Civil War historian. And the new military history essentially is is a pushback against sort of the 19th and 20, early 20th century guns and trumpets and who went up one hill and down the other. Yeah. Really looking at it more as sort of, what is the sort of social history of military, yeah. these kind of things. And this was one of the books that I had to read for it. And like you said, I, I think it's just a really, it's a really amazing, you had a person like Jay Green Glade. I'm sure there are plenty of him out yes, there. Yeah, yeah. But it's amazing that he took the time both in, in having a, a diary, keeping a diary during the war that he could then rely on. And then also this sort of very deep and I think quite sensitive reflection uh, that I think uh, many, many people who are veterans just don't, for all kinds of reasons, don't take the time to do. Yep. Um, well, and he and talks so, about that too it, 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 in the latter stage of the books. He discusses even that, doesn't he? So he's yeah. So he's it, it, it's um and he covers just maybe to do his biography very quickly. Yeah, and then coming back to what he's written because he's a, he's a super interesting guy. If you look into sort of his him as a human being as well. Yeah. So in May 1941, this is this is the sort of part we all know, I guess. He gets his PhD in the mail, which I guess is a thing they did back then. Yeah. Congratulations, you got a PhD <laughs> in philosophy from Columbia, which is no no mean feat. That's a great university yeah. in the United States. Um, and also 
you're drafted into the army. And so he ends up going into the army. And what's interesting is that I couldn't find a whole lot about what he did in the army prior to being this counterintelligence guy. Because yeah, he yeah, says yeah. he was in an armored an armored unit doing something or other. And then at some time in France, he gets a battlefield commission to lieutenant and he does he does counterintelligence work. And, and he inter- interrogates, interrogates people and stuff. Interrogates he? people, you know, and, 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 uh, and uh, yeah, and Nazis and stuff. But then interestingly, after the war, right, he he gets a Fulbright to Germany. So he goes on a Fulbright scholarship to Germany where he basically begins thinking about this. But he's also imbibing all these meetings and interactions with Germans in the immediate post-war era, um, as well as German veterans of the war. Yeah. He meets his wife, who yep. I, I didn't realize is German. Yes, yeah, extraordinary. Yeah. Um, in Dresden. <laughs> right. <laughs> so she's from Dresden and he, and, but they both work. And I think this really speaks to, to part of his, his goal in writing this book. Um, Cause it's a very much, I think in a lot of ways, an anti-war book. Yeah. Um, but he he worked at a, at reestablishing German universities. Yeah. After after the war, um, and he writes. I didn't get a chance to go all the way through them, um, but you know, being a nerdy academic, I did look them up. He wrote some journal articles about sort of the success of denazification, yep. um, and these kinds of things. And then he goes home. Uh, he goes back to the United States, and he establishes uh, the philosophy department at Colorado College, which uh, pops up on my map because it's also where Dennis Showalter. Um, yeah, famous military story and taught for a very long time. So anyway, that's sort of his, you know, and, and it's really interesting to kind of, I took a minute of, of sort of, there are these sort of snippets of his personality that come through. Uh, there's an article by this guy about how he, uh, in very uh, shortly before his death, the guy was very nice. Jay Glengray is very nice in uh, having a letter, a letter correspondence with him. And, right. um, you know, all of his colleagues seem to have, depict him as exactly the kind of person I imagined him to be, which is this sort of very super, super smart and observant, but understated, quiet sort of guy. The thing that's fascinating about it, though, is it, because it, there's a diary and there's letters in it. So he's he's commenting on on his on the on the on his correspondence and saying, where must this idea have come from? What am I trying to say in this letter? What had just happened to me? What had I seen? And I think um one of the one of the big subjects um, in the book is seeing. Interestingly, and, and it's sort of it's sort of for me was the in a way the most sort of um, uh, striking um, idea in it because he talks about comradeship and friendship and intensity of experience and and some some things that in reading about this subject you may have come across before or run into. But the idea of the the eye being lustful. Um, and the lust of the eye is the is the thing that w- when I first read this really leapt out at me. Um, a- and the idea of of war as as spectacle, and I think, I mean, you know, given given that we live right now in an age of of essentially Twitter is half full of things being blown up by one side or the other in different conflicts all over the world. I think he really massively onto something in. in in that aspect. And, it, you know, he, he, he says, war is a spectacle of something to see or never to be underestimated. There is in all of us what the Bible calls the lust of the eye, a phrase at once precise and of the widest connotation. It is precise because human beings possess as, as a primitive urge, this love of watching. We fear we will miss something worth seeing. For me, this is the bit that like I wanted to talk about most because it's so, so, so fascinating. And he talks about how, the lust of the eye is sort of um, has been additionally satisfied by the pro- progress of war into the sky. You know that, that that since conflict has changed from you know armies in bright coloured uniforms sort of lining up op- opposite each other and trying to smash each other to pieces. Since since on land war has bec- become more functional and utilitarian, which is also how he talks about the change of war in the twentieth century into becoming the sort of functional material thing in which people are edged out. He says that war in the sky offers you the chance to enjoy it, basically, as a spectator. And I, I mean, you've been, you've been to war. I mean, is this, is this a thing? Is this a thing you think you can relate to? Or I mean, how do you feel about this stuff? This is something that I, I've, I've had sort of an interesting relationship with when I was reading the book, because obviously, you know, it goes without saying, but obviously, my year. In Iraq from 0304, it was absolutely not 
World War II. <laughs> and, no, no, no. and certainly not his experience, you know, of sort of, yeah. you know, unending combat, you know. And, and in fact, in many ways, I, I often have this interesting sort of, we can talk about the ache of guilt later. Yeah. But sometimes I feel guilty because I, it wasn't as sort of violent and awful and me getting shot at all the time. And I didn't have that experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I sometimes I feel in a weird way, I wish I had, but that's stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but he talks about uh, all wishes, these kind of wishes and these kind of feelings so vividly. So, yeah, I mean, I mean so I, a lot of the things that a lot of the things that he observes as sort of um, universal qualities, if you will, right? Um, on on one hand, some of them I wasn't in a position to observe. So, for example, when he's talking about you know the various kinds of of soldiers' relationships with killing, and you know the guy who's the sort of, you know sort of like the soldier killer who just wants to kill everybody, you know, and 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 in combat, you know, seeks out sort of the enemy. I didn't have that. I, I wasn't in the position. But this this stuff, um, particularly the the war as spectacle that you've already highlighted. I mean, I think that I think it's definitely into something, and it's really interesting because like on that same page. Um, just below the war spectacle, he says, how many men in each generation have been drawn into the twilight of confused and murderous battle to see what it is like? And I, there is something really, I think, universal about the desire to see things that you cannot see in a normal civilian existence, because in a normal civilian existence, you aren't going around blowing things up. And I mean, you know, it, we, when we were in Iraq, um, I threw a grenade in an Iraqi tank for no other reason than to see what would happen. It wasn't, it, it was not, it was just sitting there. It was just, you know, I climbed up on it and I dropped a grenade in it just to see what would happen. And and of course it was entirely underwhelming because nothing happened. It just blew up inside it and there was no explosion or anything. It just, you know, and that was probably dumb in a lot of ways. And we did a lot of dumb things like that. But I think it's because you're in an environment that is permissive for doing things and destroying things that obviously is not permissive elsewhere. Um, and what's interesting is, I think, is, is and we can take that, which has kind of a value neutral characteristic when it comes to sort of the, the, the viewing of things. But as you, as you move on in the book, he starts talking more about sort of moral and ethical choices. But I think there's also an analogy there of a permissive environment where certain normal rules of society don't apply. I mean, he says, you know, talking about, again, talking about this sort of delight in seeing, right? He talks about these enduring appeals of battle, like the delight in destruction. Um, and he says, since aesthetic delight is associated with the beautiful – it may be concluded that war is the natural enemy of the aesthetic. I fear that this is in large part an illusion. And I think, I think that's a really powerful, you know, he's basically saying there are beautiful things that you can see that are also, you know, killing people. Um, I'm thinking of like, you know, tracers at night or, you know, the, the battle off Guadalcanal at nighttime where the, the destroyers, the Japanese and American navies are just sort of going after each other and the Marines are watching it on the shore, you know, and seeing things blow up. I mean, I, and, and I think he struggles with that a little bit, um, you know, of like, of how do we... There's that um, thing he's, he writes um, after leaving Rome. Yesterday morning, we left Rome and took up the pursuit of the rapidly fleeing Germans. And again, the march was past ruined, blackened villages, destroyed vehicles, dead and mangled corpses of German soldiers dead and stinking horses, blown bridges and clouds of dust that blackened our faces and filled our clothes. And this is his diary. Later, I watched a full moon sail through a cloudy sky, saw German bombers fly past and our anti-aircraft bursts around them. I felt again the aching beauty of this incomparable land. I remembered everything that I had ever been and was. It was painful and glorious. I mean, one of the things he talks about a lot, doesn't he, is he, is he, is he talks about, like like you said, that, that, that there's this per permission to behave in lots of different ways, kind of all at once. And he talks about when they liberated a, a town in France called Vienne, when they get, they get there and the population are alternating between sort of basically an ecstatic or it's almost orgiastic thrill of, you know, and a woman runs out of the crowd and runs up to him and kisses him full on the mouth and runs off and everyone cheers. And the next minute there's a bloke being chased through the street because he's a, they, they say he's a collaborator and he's obviously going to be killed by, by a lynch mob. And he says that the, 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 the extremes and the permission of, of, of that situation let people behave kind of in any way they want. 
and he describes it as as as, as ex, you know exhilarating and appalling and all those things. War compresses the greatest opposites into the smallest space and the shortest time, is what he says. He, that, but like, look, we, he does talk about the spectacle, but then he also, like, like you said, it becomes much more of a sort of um, a, a, a moral moral rumination on on war, doesn't it? It, it comes away because the spe- the spectacle of it is a thing that it's a thing I could relate. I, I can relate to the idea of I'd want to know what it's like. I mean, that's partly why I'm so fascinated by the history of it. I mean, I know, I know, I, I know, I I don't want to know what it's like, but I do want to, you know, I never want to know, but I want to know. It's that, yes, again, it's, it's it's the compression of of, of opposites, in, in, even in that desire. It's this. It's this. Also, this this sense of of um, of voyeurism. And is voyeurism a good thing, a bad thing, or a, a value neutral thing, right? Because I think yeah. oftentimes we say, oh, so-and-so is a voyeur, and there's sort of the connotation that there's something sort of perverse, you know, about. Yeah. perverse about it. Um, but, you know, I, I – and again, of course, obviously I'm coming to this now in a different place than I was when I was reading it for my comps. But I'm, I'm obviously thinking about the Holocaust as well, you know, and yeah, there are many, many students who – enter into a study of the Holocaust at, at the undergraduate level, partially to see. And, and not in, a, not in a, a weird, you know, perverse way, but there's something about this kind of gross inhumanity that, that people want to see. I, I, I often think, um, you know, sometimes people say, if you could go back to any time in history and be a fly on the wall, you know, what would you choose? And, and part of me as a Holocaust historian says, well, I'd like to go, for example, to Yanovska yeah. and see what it was like, right? Yeah. Not out of some weird perverse desire but you know you as you as you put it you know i want to see what it's like but also i probably don't want to see what it was like you know there's this kind of and i think there's something that that for the listeners i mean you really should read the book because yeah the 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 quotes that al's pulling out are absolutely amazing but that's how he writes this entire book you you can find you can find one of these on every page where he is he is the definition of sort of of ambivalent you know in the sense of he's he now he does make some points very clear where he's sort of his opinion, but he's, he's always sort of very self-reflective and unsure in the sense of whether something is a, is a, is a good or a bad thing. You know, he's, well, I he's, mean, you know, when he talks about, he talks about um, the idea of sacrifice um, uh, uh, really, r- really, really interestingly. And he says, you know, all Western thought is founded on this repulsive pretense that pain is the proper price of any good thing. And yep. Yes, it uh, it is, isn't it? And then you get, and then you get, uh, uh, and, and you know, it's an idea we, we we try to shake off. And then he talks about, you know, are we not on? Uh, are we not right in honouring the fighter's impulse to sacrifice himself for a comrade, even though it be done as it so frequently is in an evil cause? And then you 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 you're stuck there, aren't you? You you just you're stuck in the mora- moral conundrums of war because you know when people talk about soldiers fi- fighting bravely. Soldiers sat laying down their lives for their comrades. You know, pl- tons of German soldiers did that, um, and in and in service of what? Or Japanese soldiers? And and, and immediately you're you're sort of trapped here on the flypaper of his right uh, uh, of his writing, really, aren't you? You're like, oh shit, he's he's got me with, with that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think absolutely. And, and what's interesting, and this is something that he does throughout, he, he sort of approaches his experiences of the war um, in many ways, it, it kind of the same way that Primo Levi does his experiences in the Holocaust, which is from sort of a, a taxonomical perspective. Yeah. You know, he, he sort of says, these are the, you know, these are the people you will meet. And if you go to a combat unit or a military unit, these are the kinds of people the the archetypes, if you will, of like yeah. the kinds of people that you will find and almost without exception. None of them are sort of a hundred percent good or a hundred percent bad. You know, they're, if he talks about, you know, um, I think we mentioned this slightly earlier, sort of in the section on killing, right? Yeah. Um, he talks about the, the person who is kind of like the born killer, yeah. you know, the, the body count guy, the guy that goes out, kill as many Germans or, or whatever as he can, and then yeah. keeps track of it, you know, and notches on his, on his rifle or whatnot. And he says, you know, every unit will have this guy or, or yeah. people like him. And it's good because you... You need to have that kind of person. Well, he calls him he calls him homo furens as well, doesn't he? But the, ultimately, the, he says this this guy will ultimately basically feel empty inside, and when he comes home, will basically be kind of a boring a boring nobody. And he does this with every with talking about basically 
cowardice and bravery and and in some ways he I th- and I think you hit on this earlier he, he sort of he deconstructs bravery in a certain sense and sort of says that some of the people who appear to be most brave are basically just really selfish egotistical individuals yeah. who think that it can't happen to me yeah and yeah, so yeah. it's not it's not so much bravery in the sense of like I'm risking everything uh, it's more like well it's it's not going to happen to me so I don't I you know. I always said that and I'm not the only person I've said this, you know, that that bravery is not the absence of fear. Bravery is the ability to function when you're scared. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and yeah. and I, th- I think he's sort of saying the same thing. He's like, well, yeah, you know, we see this person as bravery. And he often talks about, again, that there's this archetype of the guy who just won't get killed. You know, like, like the guy you just know will never get killed. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. He was standing in the middle, standing upright in the middle of a battle, pointing things out. You know, amazing description of the coming into land in um uh on 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 D one of his I can't remember which D day the invasion of France in the yeah, south exactly. of France. It, yeah, 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 yeah. And there's a the guy smoking a cigarette, flicking the ashes in the water like he's on the Staten Island ferry. It's, and I felt that then I felt unreasonably grateful to him. It was clear that he was exposing himself no more or less than I, but his reason was in control. That he says, I long to creep through the gear, clasp him around the knees and look up to him wor- worshipfully. But yet the ridiculousness of such an action did not shame me so much as the fancied danger of moving from my spot. As you say, it's all written like this and you can you can put, pull pull things out of it in all sorts of fascinating ways. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll take a very quick break and then we'll, we'll come back because... I mean, the more I talk about this, the more the the more I want to talk about it because we don't, you know, we don't do philosophy on this podcast very often. <laughs> um, so we'll we'll take a break and we'll be back in a second. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk, where Waitman and I are discussing The Warriors um, by J. Glenn Gray, which is the most extraordinary book. You touched on guilt uh, uh, um, as, as a thing he discusses, and that's, I think, something to talk about, because he, if you, if you, if you put guilt in as a search in, into the Kindle, there's 86 mentions of guilt. It's a big, and it runs, there's a, there's a, whole, there's a, a whole section where he addresses it head on. It's the it's the most it's the most fascinating thing because after all with the, his intellect first of all he he feels he has to define guilt before we get into whatever that whatever that might mean to you or I and then he pushes into the you know the you know when he talks about the modern mentality to marvel at the absence of guilt in others uh, 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 and 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 that sort of stuff so what what do you think of how he writes about guilt again I, one of the things that that I find most engaging with this book is the way that he doesn't preach. You know, he sort of lays out, and you know he's smart. You know he's super yeah, smart yeah, yeah, because yeah. He, he's always quoting Hegel or Socrates or somebody, yeah. but he throws it out there as if like, I understand that you know that too, even if you don't, but yeah. then explains it so you don't have to ever reveal that you don't know that. He's also, he's so questioning of his of himself. It makes it so he's not preaching, right? Um, he's not saying this is how things are and you know, you, you should take my word for it. You know, at, at the beginning of the of the chapter on guilt, you know, he quotes from his own diary, where he says, "The hardest thing is that I feel no guilt." <laughs> so, you know, he's 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 questioning himself before he starts questioning others, um, yeah. and I think I think that's one of the things that's really really interesting, and this idea of conscience and what it is that that allows soldiers, and he's he's dancing around the subject, but he talks about it earlier in the in the in the section on images of the enemy yeah. about sort of the crimes that Americans committed, particularly yeah. in the Pacific. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he doesn't shy away from, from that. And what you have, I think with this discussion of guilt is a long, a sort of long form meditation on human psychology. Yeah. Right. And so he says at one point um, in war itself, the most potent quieters of conscience are evidently the presence of others who are doing the same things and the consciousness of acting under the orders of people higher up who will answer for one's deeds. Yeah. You know, and that just sums up or, or in some ways previews, you know, 20 years versus of, of social psychology and, and the investigation of people in all kinds of situations committing, you know, criminal behavior. You yeah. know, this idea that of the group mentality and what, and how that dampens the individual, yeah, 
sort well, of quote, responses to That it. quote goes on. So long as the soldier thinks of himself as one among many and identifies himself with his unit, army, and nation, his conscience is unlikely to awaken and feel the need to respond. You know, and this is also, he, he, he's, he's, he's spent, before this, he's spent, he's talked about, you know, um, comradeship and, 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 you know, how, how units cohere and all that sort of thing and how comradeship is the loyalty that gets you through and all this sort of stuff. So to, to then, to then go, right. So here's a consequence of that, which is that it, is it, is it allows you to essentially wash your hands of what you've done. It, 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 it's fascinating. And then he, and then he goes, I must begin with myself as I was. So as you say, he, he says, fine, here's, here's what I'll let's set up, set up my stall, but here's how I felt about it. There's some instant um, um, with a Gestapo agent and all this sort of stuff. And it ends with him saying, I hope it will not rest too hard on my conscience. And yet if it does, uh, if it does not, I shall be disturbed also. So he's, again, he's caught in that. I mean, it's almost, it's, it's almost catch 22 uh, philosophical positions, isn't it? That, that, you know, you've got to be mad to want to do this, but you can only get out, you know, going to get out of it if you're mad sort of thing. Well, and he, he also, I mean, what's interesting is sort of the interplay between his, his philosophical reflections on what's happening and what he's actually doing, because mm -hmm. he dances around it in sort of sugge in suggestive ways. Um, but he's kind of involved in torture. Yeah. Um, I mean, not necessarily, he doesn't say he personally was, but clearly he's around his, it. He's yeah. around it. People in his unit are beating up prisoners. Um, he's also, you know, he mentioned several, examples uh, there's a really interesting example in the earlier in the book where uh, i don't know if you remember this one uh he's talking to um a free french guy so a resistance guy oh, who God, has captured yeah. the who has captured this beautiful woman who was a a traitor of some kind and he's like yeah she's really she's really pretty um you know it's, uh, we're gonna shoot her and 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 he's sort of he's he's aghast at this. Like it horrifies him, you know, that this person has, as you sort of suggested with the the example in Vienna, you know, that that this, these sort of two parts can exist simultaneously. Yeah. Um, but yet, you know, he then questions himself in these scenarios where you know he he was in some way adjacent to yeah. torture or whatnot, and he didn't really do anything to sort of stop it either. Right. Um, right. And I think I think I think some of that's really, really interesting. And of course, I think it's also really interesting to look at when he talks about the Germans, because particularly knowing what everyone knows now, right? Because we gave yeah. the introduction, the fact that he had lived in Germany, was married to a German woman, um, yeah. before all this happens, it sort of does give a bit of context when he starts talking about can we hold German soldiers accountable for fighting for the Nazis. Around that is a bit where he says, I was amazed by how many how many American civilian soldiers appeared to put great weight on taking the oath of the soldier. Which is because after one of the one of the one of the sort of explanations about the after Hitler dies and the collapse of the, the of German resistance is that the oath the oath has ended and all this sort of thing. So I think it's very interesting that he talks about Americans and their relationship to the oath, their oath, in order to grant them that gap between their actions and their responsibility for their actions. And then talks about in a more legalistic nation like Germany, where the distinction between law and right or between state justice and private morality has never been sharply drawn. So he gets into the, you know, so he's talking about, well, Americans and their oaths. If Americans are allowed to afford themselves this gap with their oath, don't be surprised if Germans do. That's a really fascinating point to bring up because it, because it, in so much of the history I've read, it's all been about, well, the Germans have their oath and that's why they're doing what they're doing. Well, how, why won't they give up in 1945? Well, because they've sworn their oath to the Fuhrer and all this sort of thing. Yeah, but but there are other oaths in operation as well. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and again, he brings us, he makes us think about both sides and he makes us think about what's asked of everyone in war. Br brings us back to the idea of bravery and self-sacrifice and all these things all at once. I mean, it there's two th quotes that I sort of, I think deserve to be kind of um put together right so yeah on the on the on the uh, he says to what extent is a german soldier in the last war i.e world war ii guilty who kept himself free of personal crimes but was forced to experience more or less directly atrocities committed by his fellow soldiers and who was not blind to hitler's mad ambitions and then a slightly farther down he goes and this is one of his more prescriptive statements the answer can only be that no outsider has a moral right to make such an accusation about either the soldiery or the people as a whole. And when I, when I read that, I was kind of like, that's a little on point. Like, are you, are you talking to me, Jake Langray? Because I frequently sort of 
I, I, I'm, I'm more willing to make those kinds of, of, of characterizations, you know, and he's, he's questioning that. But then if we go back slightly earlier, he talks about a German soldier, a, a really re- a remarkable story in its own right that, that should be a movie about a guy, a German soldier who essentially deserts to the resistance after his unit commits a, a, atrocities in France. And, and, and it, it, he says conscience, this is, he's talking about, he's talking about how and how and why soldiers or really anybody is forced to make a choice, right? And he says, conscience has isolated him and its voice is a warning. If you do this, you will not be at peace with me in the future. You can do it, but you ought not. You must act as a man and not as an instrument of another's will. And so again, even in the same chapter, there's this, on the one hand, he's saying essentially, well, it's not fair to sort of, he's wrong, by the way, he does say that, you know, anybody would have been shot if they had disobeyed, which is, is not altogether true. But he's saying essentially, we can't judge these people as a group. Um, but then he's also saying, but in these people must have been, some of these people must have been this voice. And again, I think that speaks to something that is human about all sort of atrocities, whether it's genocide or war crimes or whatever, which is that 99% of us, of people that are involved in these kinds of things, whether it's the Holocaust or war crimes, whatever, are psychologically normal human beings. They're not sociopaths, meaning they don't, they don't lack precisely this idea of conscience he's talking about. They don't lack the ability to empathize and to imagine what's happening to that other person and how the other person must feel. And so if we take that as the starting point, then, then his prescriptions here and his discussions are really, really interesting because it means that most of those people at some level have had that inside them, unless, unless they're being acted upon more strongly by some of these other things that he talks about. Which I, th- I think is something that I find really, really compelling out of all of this. Um, and again, it, it's, it's him not presenting us with the easy answer of, of here's, here's what it is, and here's the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. Which gets back to, you know, this, it, this whole chapter on image of the enemy, um, you know, some of which is, is, is relatively obvious. But he's consciously, I think, drawing on the Pacific as an example. I mean, obviously, he's experienced World War II, and he's been to a concentration camp. He talks about that a little bit. And he's experienced sort of Germans. But really, he's talking about the Americans in the Pacific um, and and what war does and what various views of the enemy do yep. to sort of spur these kinds of, of inhuman behavior. Well, yes, he's very interested in that idea that instead of the enemy, they become my enemies. That 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 that, that you're you're not fighting men, but embodiments of undifferentiated undifferentiated evil, which is what 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 you're you're doing. To to I mean, the the, the stuff I found really fascinating, really really interesting. That he was that, that where he gets to grips the idea that you know that the enemy, while you're trying to kill them, you you they don't ex- they essentially are material. They don't exist. And then the minute you capture them, you treat them the way you prefer to be treated yourself, as as a human being. While while you're in combat, they're they're placed in a p- place where they aren't human. And then the and and the way he talks about th- what that is, uh, uh, and what what are people trying to do by doing that, trying to sort of again keep their conscience clear. And obviously, th- there's the re- reciprocity of it that you, you the hope is that you'll be treated humanely if you're captured sensible rules require according to this code humane treatment of a surrendering enemy who a few minutes before was intent on destroying your life and who probably succeeded in blasting life and limbs from numerous soldiers under you under your command such reasoning appears to be crystal clear to a professional mind and he's so he's saying how can that possibly be it, it, it it's it's just so it so interesting the way he he tackles that because that's one of the that's after all one of the sort of supposedly in the Western way of war that's what that's what we do isn't it and and the and yet you can find plenty of examples where that doesn't that isn't happening yeah I mean it, this is a, this is one of the really interesting portions of the of the book as well because he talks about in this in this this section on images of the enemy which we've been sort of talking about yeah. you know, these various various different ways of viewing the the enemy and, and the one that you sort of highlighted is the professional soldier who sort of he, it's all a game, essentially. Yeah. You know, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, that you know, the the enemy is the opponent, um, but it's really all about how can I best you know marshal my pieces on the board and win the game. Yeah. And he talks about some other sort of more emotional, you know, the enemy is like the the devil or or, or yeah. subhuman, etc. 
but he, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is precisely this moment that you've talked about where, okay, the enemy is this evil subhuman inhuman force bent upon the destruction of, you know, mom, dad, and apple pie and everything. Great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but then all of a sudden they're captured and they're just a guy, you know? And, and he, he says, you know, um, what this does to people who have, who have the prior sort of mindset, you know, the enemy could not have changed. They must reason so quickly from a beast to a likable human being. Thus the conclusion is nearly forced upon them that they have been previously blinded by fear and hatred yeah. Yeah. and the propaganda of their own government, yeah. y- you know, which is a really kind of a, a subversive thing for the, you know, the greatest generation to say, but you know, he, he's talking about this cognitive dissonance that you pointed out of like all of a sudden, you know, that's a guy who wants a cigarette or that's yeah. a guy who needs to go to the bathroom or whatever. And it's just a person. And, and that it breaks down this idea of, of sort of um, th- this sort of caricatured cartoonish vision of the enemy, which then leads to this place. I, I'm curious what you think. I'm still trying to sort it out in my head. Yeah. He talks about this idea of purgation, right? This yes. idea that this idea that if, that if, that there's actually a benefit to having that extreme emotional trauma of recognizing your enemy as human, because in some way it, it lets you work through that and kind yeah. of remain human yourself. Whereas the people who don't, who just are like the soldier killers or the ones who just live for war or live for, or view the enemy as this, you know, completely inhuman thing, they don't, they don't have that opportunity. They're somehow yeah. damaged by it as a result. Yeah. Well, he, he t- talks about the incident of um, in the Pacific where they find a single Japanese soldier, don't they? Uh, th- these these guys find a single Japanese soldier and they basically use him as a live target. Uh, and and I swear there was a scene in the Pacific, the movie, the, the miniseries Pacific, where they did exactly that. Um, exactly that. Anyway, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he talks about how, how can this now, a few years later, it appeared to him gr- grisly and cruel enough. At the time, he had no conscience about it, whatever, this guy telling the story. And that, and then, and then he takes us to you know, no, no aesthetic reconciliation with one's fate as a warrior was likely because no moral purg- purgation was possible. This, the, the, this idea of purgation is really, really fascinating because it's obviously a thing that, because as he said himself, I didn't feel bad about a lot of stuff. Don't feel particularly guilty. He's trying to find it for himself, and hoping that hoping that others have achieved it too. I mean, it, I mean, almost. I mean, you know, because because I'm because we, before we before we started chatting I, I was talking about my um my book about writing about Arnhem I, I almost feel reading this is is as essential as reading any of the battle diaries to make sense of what people are experiencing and and particularly that thing of um because because they they a lot of the veterans there they talk about how because you're not in the line you're parachuted in somewhere suddenly you're in the middle of all this and it's all happening very very quickly and and suddenly you're faced with the enemy rather than coming up, hearing the guns, getting into position, you know, O groups and coming forward. And all this, you know, you're suddenly you're there in the middle of it all. And it sort of uncorks this sort of um, real savagery. Well, it's, it's 360, right? I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're, yeah, you're literally set surrounded. on all sides. You're you know? literally surrounded. But, but, it un- it, but it uncorks all the reactions all at once. You've got lots of people running away. You know, and uh, for good reason, because it's going very badly. And you've got lots of people, all of it happening all at once. And I think that this this book is this, this book has that because, as you said right at the beginning, you know, this isn't chaps on maps. It isn't arrows. It isn't. It isn't. They're over here, and we're over there, and we did gallantly. He's, he's, he, he is not interested in that. And I think it, for, for that, it, it, I think it kind of essential, really. To to um, you know, we we're only getting in the head of one man, but he's we're very fortunate. He's an extremely clever one. <laughs> <laughs> insightful one and and a man with a you know a grip a grip on his subject matter that I think is kind of unrivaled. I mean I've not read anything like this. I've read sort of essays and things that kind of get this way, but I've never got to read anything like this at all. And there's that really brilliant story that he comes back to at the end of the book where he meets a hermit and, and, and in Italy. And I almost wonder whether the hermit's a creation, right, for this book. And the story is he's, he's in Italy and he, he meets some old guy and the old guy says, who are you and what are you doing here? And he tries to explain the Second World War to a man who's lived on his own for, for, for decades or whatever. Who's fighting what and why and how and all that. And he says the, the further he gets into it, you know, the less he understands it him, himself. 
I mean, I, I obviously I trust him as an author, but that almost feels like he needs a parable to 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 um tell us about how crazy war is in a way. Not to get too nerdy, right? But it has kind of the the an echoes of sort of Plato's The Cave, right? Of yeah. Like of like yeah. how do we how do we get a sense of how do we understand what the thing is that yeah. we're we've experienced, which yeah. seems to be very obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like, you know, when my daughter asked me to explain something that I think is very obvious, but then once I start trying to actually explain what it is, yeah. it's actually quite complex to break it down into its constituent parts for yeah. someone that isn't familiar with with that thing. Yeah. And I think that's that that's kind of what he's doing with the hermit is like, well, yeah. you know, how am I explaining why there are British people fighting yeah, Italians right. who are who are also fighting Italians yeah. in Italy. You know, this doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. But yeah, I, yeah. I think that's as you point out, I think that's an allegory for the whole thing. For you know yeah. him yeah. trying to make sense. Because I and and I think, you know, one of the questions that one might have when you read this book, sort of what is what is he what is he trying to do? Yeah. What's the point of this? Part of it is, you know, this, as I said, I think this is very much an anti-war book because it, it, yeah. it speaks it speaks basically to what we would call today sort of psychic or moral injury. Yeah. You know, that 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 that, that soldiers experience, whether it's, you know, through the sort of horrors of combat or through, you know, having to engage with civilians or engage with, you know, potentially you know, criminal activity or their yeah, guilt, et cetera. But, the moral degradation and brutalization. And yeah. that's what he's talking about. And he says, essentially, and I can't find it. He says it a couple of times, but he says, he says, the only, the only thing we can do is love more. Um, yeah. Which if you had read that from probably literally anybody else, you'd be like, yeah, what, what, a, bu- what a bunch of baloney that is. Yeah. You know, what a, yeah, yeah. what a sort of Hallmark card with, when you read, Gray say it. You're kind of like I get you. I, I get you, man. Like I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I see what you're doing. You know, like you're. He's basically like the only thing that can that prevent prevent this happening again is to yeah. be the reflections that he's reflecting. Yeah. In the book, which I think is, I mean, I'm a I'm a deeply cynical human being and a deeply <laughs> sort of sarcastic person. Yeah. Um, and I'll be the first to sort of say, oh, whatever, man, like make love, not war. That's nonsense. Yeah. But you, you understand what he's saying when he says that, you know, he, yeah. he's not, he's, he's, it's almost well, he's like sift, he's, he's sifted the options, hasn't he, for you? He's, 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 he's done the, he, he's, he's, he's not plump. He's, he's not landed that on you like the Beatles saying all you need is love. He's, he's, he's gone through all the, all the other options and all the, and all the consequences and, uh, 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 and tangents that war and the experience of war and the brutalization and the necessities of war. Because he talks about, you know, he says, if it's necessary to do this. And, and these are questions that are completely alive right now. After all, you know, like, what, what, what do you do in order to, to defeat your enemy? I mean, what can you do? What are you allowed to do? What should you do? And what, and what does that say about who you are and what you mean to yourself and what your society represents? And you know, which is all the low end stuff. You know, uh, uh, the, 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 these questions are completely madly alive right now. Um, uh, and this uh, idea that that um, he mentions a couple times, you know, that, that civilians, like the farther you are from the front or the actual sharp end, actually, the more bloodthirsty and sort of yeah. intolerant you become about yeah. sort of what you're what you're doing. And, and, it, and it's interesting because I, I can't find the, the. But at one point he says. With regards to kind of the the general criminality or the general yeah. sort of make, making bad choices in war, that that our generation, meaning the greatest generation, I mean his generation, yeah. is not particularly different than anybody else's, which I think yeah. is, is really interesting given sort of the the mythology that has developed over the past seventy years about yeah. this this group of people. And one of the things that I wanted to, I wanted to, that, that struck me as well, just to throw out there is. We haven't talked about it a lot because the, the love chapter is kind of covers a lot of ground. Yeah. Um, but but he, he talks about, I think it's really, really, really poignant about how comradeship is really not that great. Um, and how, you know, it's much better to have a friend. And yes, what it's, the difference, it's funny what the about difference that, is, yes. you know, that, that and, I, and it's so true. And I've, I've seen these other places where, you know, he says essentially that, you know, in the moment, in the war, you're like, ah, oh, you know, my buddies in my unit where we're, no one can ever be as close as we are. Like the bond that we have is this unshakable, yeah, you know, um, experience, shared experience. No one will understand it except for ourselves. But then, actually, he's like, I never really 
saw these people again. I never hung out with them. I never really <laughs> yeah. wanted to hang out with them. Yeah. Um, and I think I think he says I think it's in this book. He says, and when they do hang out, they basically need to get drunk to kind of re-experience that comradeship. But that really, it's not the same thing as a really solid friendship, which involves yeah. a lot of give and take and yeah. and self and criticism of each other and challenging each other. Yeah. And I thought that was yeah. a really interesting no, thing he's, because he's, yeah, he basically says just because it's forged in extremity doesn't give it value necessarily. He, 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 he says yes, it's a thing, and the loyalty of it is 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 it, but, but a lot of the loyalty that uh, that surrounds comradeship is being generated by an army to get you to do what you want what they want you to do as well, that it's, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, it's imposed rather than, rather than, uh, uh natural. Um, we could, t- we could talk about this forever. We recommend everyone, um, uh, find a copy. It's, it's easy to get hold of and it's on, it's, it's on Kindle. Certainly. Wait, man, I, I, I'm afraid that's all I've got time for. <laughs> we, we can't cover the entire, we can't cover the entire book. You, as, as, as the, as the children's uh, reading show in the United States used to say, you know, and to learn more, You'll have to buy the book. There we are. Like, you, know, so to learn the book. More. you will have to uh, read the book. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Um, thank, thanks, thanks for coming on. Um, thanks for having me as always. We should do this again. We should do a little book club thing. We don't, we don't need Jim butting in. Well, and we didn't even, we, this uh, PS, we didn't even mention the bizarreness, which is the fact that Hannah Arendt yeah. wrote the foreword yeah. <laughs> to, the, to yeah. this volume, which is just like, what? Like, yeah. And, and his, and his, his, uh, his relationship with uh, Martin Heidegger, who had, you know, obviously some questionable uh, yeah. Nazi ties as well, but, you know, we'll leave that for We'll leave that another for another day. time. Um, thanks everyone for listening. Um, we recommend The, the Warriors by Jake Glenn Gray. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Wakeman. Uh, thanks everybody. Bye-bye.